I'm Ewa Messer. I'm the producer and host of Poured Over. And Eleanor Catton won the Booker Prize for her first or second novel, excuse me, The Luminaries, which was 863 pages of a most excellent story set during New Zealand's gold rush in the 1860s. And you may have also seen the adaptation that Eleanor wrote. We're here to talk about Burnham Wood, which I love this book. I love the dread. I love the claustrophobia. I love the characters. I love the inevitability of the ending. All of it. All of it. And it is a very different book from The Luminary. So, Eleanor, hi. Thank you so much for joining us. But where did this book come from? <laughs> hi. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so looking forward to um, having a chat. Yeah. Where did it come from? Gosh. In a, in a way, it kind of came out of a feeling of betrayal, I suppose, that I had looking around me at how politicians the world over were kind of failing people of my generation um, on pretty much any measure you could you could think of. Um, and that sense of kind of despair, I suppose, about the future that seemed to set in in a very particular way around about 2016. Suddenly these intimations that we all we maybe had had for some time that the future was going to get very dark very soon right suddenly seemed more real than ever and kind of more inescapable than ever and I wanted to write about this very kind of contemporary feeling not in a way that would advance a particular political point of view but in a way that would kind of maybe just you know problematize or dramatize this relationship that we had with the future, um, which is one of the reasons why I went back to Macbeth, actually, because it's, of course, Macbeth is a um, a play that's all about prophecy. It's animated by prophecy. And so I went back to that play and reread it kind of with everything that was happening in terms of world events resounding in my head and suddenly saw it as, in, in a really different way. I saw it as a play that contains very interesting and loud warnings about what happens when you regard the future with too much certainty if you're if you're too convinced about what what lies just down the road because of course Macbeth makes the ending of Macbeth happen not, none of that was written on the wall before before he received those prophecies and I and so I kind of wanted to achieve a similar effect in a novel by um, writing a book about incremental political actions and moral actions that end up kind of having these enormous effects that were avoidable, you know, like the, an, an ending that was avoidable, but hopefully feels like the accumulation of all of the, the human errors that came. came oh, <laughs> oh, when I realized what was happening and how it was happening. Oh, yes, it, it can. The payoff is really, really excellent. I mean, this is part eco thriller. It's part political commentary, as you just mentioned, but it's also a social satire. And I have to say, so one of the British reviews said, you know, guerrilla gardeners. And I was like, you know, gardening seems a very soft word to <laughs> use for what your incarnation of Burnham Wood is about. Gorilla is definitely right, but garden doesn't quite strike what they're doing. Well, Would you explain yeah, your so, Burnham Wood? <laughs> so in, in, in the novel, that's the name that a group of activists in New Zealand give to themselves. And they're kind of broadly left-wing, kind of anti-capitalist, um, mostly fairly young. They're kind of mostly millennials and <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. uh, younger. What they do is they go around um, the South Island of New Zealand, which is where I grew up, and plant uh, sustainable edible gardens in neglected spaces. And sometimes they do this in um, collaboration with the people who own the land right. um, in exchange for half of the yield of whatever whatever they grow. But more often they do it illegally and, you know, in, in public spaces and via trespassing and, um, <laughs> and, 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 and that kind of thing. So they're a group that when the novel begins has reached a kind of impasse where um, they've kind of reached the limit of, of um, how big they can grow without a kind of a serious rethink of of their their principles as a as an organization they've never quite incorporated or kind of joined the conventional economy and for some people within the group to do that would be totally anathema to what the group is all about and for others that's the only means of survival and so in some ways i i kind of saw this group as facing a challenge that i think faces 
a lot of left-wing organizations, which is that do you compromise a little on your principles and maybe succeed in the in the conventional economy, or do you hold fast to your principles and possibly lose or um, kind of go extinct? You know, those are the uh, options sometimes. Should we meet three early, tw- I guess, early 20s? Yeah, Mira and Shelley and Tony sort of. Uh, I think they're late school. 20s. Yeah, they're a little bit younger than me. Yeah. Okay. So late 20s, out of school, Mira has ostensibly, let's just refer to it as founding Burnham Wood. I mean, she sort of created it. Everyone else sort of fell into it. And she's lived quite a nice life, but her parents were not fully expecting this to be the thing that she does. This was not sort of the plan. And she's very charismatic and she convinces a lot of people to join, but she's a great character to follow. And then we also meet Shelley, who's sort of her, she's presented as kind of like best pal, sidekicky, but... Shelly shows us who she is, too. And then there's Tony, who is one of the original founders, but has left for the U.S. and has now come. Or am I assuming he left for the U.S.? Or do you? It just occurred to me. I don't. All oh, I know no, he was, he was in Mexico. Yeah, he was in Mexico. OK. And now he's come back to New Zealand. So the three of them and watching sort of their evolution, um, I, I do want to start there because. The idealism and the genuine love and concern for what they want to do they're still messy kids i realize i'm talking about people in their late 20s as kids and maybe that's not the right no, word but, that's, me, but they're that's, very that's young exactly. yeah the, i think that and i think that that's something that for better and for worse has come to define my generation and people younger than me that there has been this way that the kind of the buy-in to the con to to the economy as as practiced around the world is so high that as to kind of trap a lot of people in a state of adolescence relative to the governance of their countries until I mean I'm 37 now you know that I it's still enormous news whenever anybody of my age buys a house in New Zealand we all we're we're all just like how how could that possibly happen you know (laughs) Um, whereas if you contrast that with my parents, I think they were on about the third property that they'd owned, you know, sequentially. But it was, it was, they'd been pro- homeowners for almost twenty years by this point, and that's only, I mean, that's only to talk about property. It's, it's not really to talk about any of the other ways that young people really ought to be stakeholders in this. They ought to be shareholders in societies of which they are stakeholders. <laughs> but yeah, so it, it's. When when I first conceived of the novel, I I had actually sketched out a whole lot more Burnham Wood characters. I I, um, I hadn't yet kind of um, shaped the novel in my mind, so I'd, I'd yeah. written out kind of character sketches for about eight or nine characters, and Shelley interestingly was not one of them. It, Amira and Tony were there uh-huh. from the very beginning. Okay. The reason why Shelley kind of came to be created was that I when I was kind of mulling over the book, I I I kind of lit upon the idea. Well, the conviction that all the great tragedies are stories ultimately of betrayal. They're stories where people betray the people closest to them, but they're also stories where people betray themselves. They kind of betray the the better person that they could have become. And so that kind of led me to create Shelley. And I I took her name from one of my great literary heroes, Mary Shelley, because I wanted to kind of give the uh, kind of plant the idea in the reader's mind, even in this very subliminal way. Like is mm-hmm. is who is she? Is she Dr. Frankenstein or is she the monster? You know, she's <laughs> she's kind of this um, figure who's lived in Mira's shadow for a long time mm-hmm. and has a complicated relationship with that. I think that she was very eager to play that role in the beginning. And it is it's it's kind of started to chafe a little bit. It's turned into a little bit of resentment. And she also, you know, in a very ordinary human way, I think, has grown tired of the privations that this kind mm-hmm. of act, life of activism is is are, are kind of asking of her, and so at the very beginning of the book, she she's kind of looking for a way out. And when Tony returns from overseas, she she thinks to herself, "Oh, what a great idea! I know what I'll do. I'll sleep with this guy because I know that Mira has been in love with him forever, and he's been in love with Mira forever. And if I can just get in there and betray her." then I won't have to have these difficult conversations because the betrayal will effectively speak for itself. So that's that's kind of where she begins. It's it's kind of a funny place to pick up pick up on a character, I guess. It was a great place to pick up on a character because a lot of what you're wrestling with comes through Mira and Shelley's relationship. 
And a lot of the big philosophical questions, I mean, at one point they're fighting about, you know, which would you prefer, and I shouldn't say fighting, but they're not agreeing on, you know, which would you prefer to do less? Say thank you for something you really don't want or apologize when you don't mean it. And I'm like, well, that's a very sort of adolescent way to approach a problem. But at the same time, they have a lot of these conversations and they're really sort of feeling it out. And at one point, Shelley even says, she's like, oh, well, I know Mira's lying when she agrees with me with everything. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> this is a level of honesty from a character. I mean, Mira has moments where she really is kind of actively lying to herself. And I don't know if she knows she's lying to herself because control mm -hmm. and image is very important to her. And I mean, it's important to a lot of people, so I'm not smacking on the character, but no, you can Shelley, smack away. <laughs> yeah, well, Shelly is really showing us who she is and she's <laughs> fun to read. I mean, she is, I, is nefarious the right word? I mean, she's, she yeah. wants what she wants. This, yeah. I, I, I love Shelly. I mean, I, it's, I, I love all the characters in this book yeah. in a way that I, it's, it's quite different from anything else I've written, actually. Mm -hmm. I feel, mm -hmm. I, I think because, I I was very clear in my ambition from the start that I wanted it to be a, a very active novel from a kind of a dramatic yeah. point of view. I wanted the characters to decide and to act and to, you know, not not at all be apathetic, but to kind of right, right. Um, to to kind of hang themselves by their own rope um, in in whatever way that meant. I, I I because of that, I spent a lot of time thinking about the characters as people, kind of what would they do in this situation, right. and you know, kind of their 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 histories and that kind of thing. And yeah, I mean, I think I think with with Shelley and Mira that it was it's a friendship that it could have been so beautiful. <laughs> I, I, right. I think how I kind of see their friendship. They, I think that they do have a lot of love for each other, actually, and they can make each other laugh. Their their senses of humor are very well matched. Mm -hmm. But they're each like many of us, like all of us, they're kind of scared to talk about some kind of the more un, uncomfortable truths about their own nature. And it's that failure of communication or kind of failure to admit some of the, um, I don't know, less palatable things about themselves to themselves and to each other that kind of plant the seeds of, of this relationship going wrong, I suppose. It's part of the fun of reading Burnham Wood, though, because the, the lies they tell each other, the lies they tell Tony, the intersection of withholding of information and then the things they put forth to each other because they're trying to, it's wild how they manipulate each other and themselves though. I mean, in some cases they're manipulating themselves because they don't quite, Tony's, you know, off chasing what he's chasing. And I'm, I'm trying to stay spoiler free <laughs> because this is going to air on your American pub date, but it's wild. The intersections of these, what you think are tiny moments, right? You think they're just tiny mo and then, oh no, everything has consequences. <laughs> Everything has consequences. Yeah, obviously, I, th I thought a lot about Macbeth when I was writing this. I, 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 I should say that I don't think that a familiarity with Macbeth is at all necessary, oh, no, to no, 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 or, no. or anything like that. But it, well, one thing that interests me about Macbeth as a play is that, with all of Shakespeare's other tragedies, especially, mm -hmm. it, there are moments where you really identify with. The, the main character you feel like oh I'm this I'm like King Lear on the heath or yeah. I'm you know, I'm like Hamlet in this moment or or whatever or I'm like Othello um but it's very seldom that I mean actually it's never that I ever hear anybody self-identifying with Macbeth right Macbeth right is, it tends to be a um a, a, a weapon you you you, would, you diagnose Macbeth like qualities and other mm -hmm. people you don't diagnose them in yourself and that that got me thinking that that I think that so much of Macbeth is actually about blindness. It's about what he fails to see, what he fails to put mm -hmm. together. And um, that that interested me. We obviously can't identify the blindnesses in ourselves because right. otherwise they wouldn't be blindnesses. But it's almost like we can't, even that state of being self-blind, we can't even go that far <laughs> to, to, to kind of to admit that, yes, we too are probably self-blind in some ways. I mean, as an example, though, like, Tony's looking for power, though I don't think he would ever describe it that way. Shelley is certainly looking for power. She might admit that she's looking for power. And Mira has a very strange relationship with power. And yet, you know, here are these three kids who are basically saying, well, I want to change the world. I want to do good. 
you know, because that's where Shelley starts too as well. But I, you know, I want to make everything better. And yet, ultimately, what they're looking for is power and control and all of these things that are, you know, not necessarily thought of as positive attributes in people always. They make for great stories. But yeah. I love that connection to Macbeth because, I mean, ultimately, I know you said it, it's a play about prophecy, but it's also a play about power. <laughs> <laughs> right. And about and just about human nature, really. Right. You know, I think that I mean, power is a funny word because it's so often um, kind of codes negative. Yeah. yeah. But um, there are other ways, you know, you can talk about sovereignty or you could talk yep. about influence or you could talk about um, notoriety. There's, there's mm -hmm. just just kind of different ways of, of 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 speaking about it that might seem to be more appealing in different contexts. Um, what, what, one of the 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 kind of biggest non-fiction influences on this book was this marvelous book by Elliot Higgins, who's the founder of the Bellingcat um, open source yeah. intelligence mm -hmm. agency um, called We Are Bellingcat, and um, it's just it's just such a fascinating book, especially if you're a if you're writing a thriller, but really if you're just a citizen of anywhere in the world, it's so fascinating to read about how how much open source data is out there for anybody to. Um, read and and interpret in ways that have the power to topple dictators and to solve unsolved crimes and and you know the the the, the list goes on. Um, but it, but again, thinking back to Macbeth, it occurred to me after having read We Are Bell and Cat that the the things that the witches say to Macbeth, the prophecies that they that they make to him, are all actually they're kind of open source information. They're, they're, yeah, they're yeah. that are available that would have been available to anybody kind of you know so mm -hmm. the, the idea that any army that marched on Dunsinane uh, the castle where Macbeth lives would probably use forest cover as camouflage that's not a that's not a prophecy that's just a that's kind of kind of common sense you know mm -hmm. the, the idea that Macduff was born by Caesarian they could have found that out by looking at his doctor's records you know <laughs> even the promotion that Macbeth gets at the beginning uh, to Thane of Cawdor that that has already happened by the time Macbeth receives that prophecy. So it's kind of interesting. It's it's not really a play that is about all powerful forces that are telling us about a future that has to happen no matter what. It's a it's a it's more of a play about what happens to us when we we have a sense of that inevitability and how we kind of rush towards this future that we think we already know. That really interested me in terms of the climate crisis, because I, mm -hmm. I think that there is, there is a lot of despair. There is a lot of sense that, that the writing is on the wall, that we've kind of passed the point of no return. And, and of course, like, I mean, not, not to minimize those right. points of view. I mean, a, a lot of the time, that's, that's not even a point of view. It's scientific fact about kind of extinctions and and mm -hmm. and just losses that can't be um kind of recovered but equally i think that if we don't have a sense of hope about the 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 future that future is going to come at us so much faster and so much worse <laughs> than 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 if we you know if we felt as though we still had a chance and so i kind of i feel kind of mixed about it you know i i wanted to play with both sides of that that problem i suppose which brings me to three more characters in the book because we would be remiss if we did not. So there's um, <clears throat> Sir Owen and Lady Darvish, who, you know, he's kind of who you expect him to be. He's not as smart as he thinks he is. Lady <laughs> Darvish, on the other hand, turns out to be a really excellent character. She is so grounded in ways that her husband is not. And then we've also got the guy that I took to sort of calling just the American, Robert Lamont. It's a bit hard on Americans, really. Uh, you know, I... <laughs> I know my people when I see them. The three of them and the way their story intersects, Mir is kind of the inciting incident of the whole thing. <laughs> and I'm la even though this is a big political novel, it, this book is so much fun to read. It is so much fun to read because the characters balance out all of the stuff that happens and the stuff never stops happening. <laughs> and here we are on a giant farm on the southern island of New Zealand. And yet the sense of dread that I had as I was reading. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> the sense of dread and the claustrophobia and the very sort of noir atmosphere, even though you are talking about people who are trying to do good. Then we get 
Sir and Lady Darvish. Um, <laughs> sorry, we don't do that here, so I don't, you know. Well, whatever. we didn't either in New Zealand for a yeah, while. Yeah, okay. Was, so was, this makes me laugh. Kind of part of my um, the okay. fun that I had with the the kind of the book satirical intentions. Knighthoods, uh, kind of, you know, chivalric titles sure. were abolished in New Zealand under the um, Helen Clark government, and then the um, the government let, <laughs> headed by Sir John Key. Uh -huh. brought them back, um, you know, with a very obvious consequence uh -huh. that he then awarded himself one, or, or was awarded one, um, when he left office, which I, I just feel as a New Zealander is such a ludicrous situation to be in. <laughs> it, would, it just kind of amuses me. Americans have a long history of apparently buying those things from people who needed to raise money in the UK. I'm just like, <laughs> okay, can we just all of this? But I do, I like it. I, I think that Sir Owen's definitely the kind of person who, if you asked him to sell it, he probably would. <laughs> oh, in a heartbeat, in an absolute heartbeat. But they're the ostensible owners of the farm, which is a really significant size property. They're, they're talking about subdividing it and all of these other things. And then the American comes in, Lemoyne. He and Mira meet when she breaks into the property. And he says, well, listen, I think what you're doing is kind of cool. Let me give you some money. And she goes back to Burnham Wood. And it's like she lights a stick of dynamite. You knew, though, you needed to have the Darvishes. I mean, obviously, Lamont, we will come back to him. But we kind of needed the Darvishes to set yeah. the stage in a way. Right. So, so this... You know, going back to those very, very early um, drafts I had, or kind of early sketches I had for the novel, the Darvishes actually weren't a part of my initial thinking for the book. I initially just imagined it as a kind of a clash between an American billionaire who is a survivalist coming to New Zealand to buy, you know, one of these properties you often hear about in the news where ultra wealthy people um, are kind of buying insurance properties in order to go and flee in the case of catastrophes that they may or may not have caused <laughs> elsewhere in the world. The New Zealand government has been famously hospitable to um, the ultra wealthy in this regard. I had kind of originally just envisaged, envisaged the book as a clash between these two kind of ends of the spectrum, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then, mm -hmm. of course, like most novelists begin with an idea that is that can divide into two and then they end up okay. settling with an idea that can divide into three because it ends up um, kind of being richer and with more kind of scope for patterning. And right. so I started seeing the book at that point generationally and realized that actually the the baby boomers effectively were a, 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 the kind of the missing piece in this in this link. You've got the 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 Gen X um, billionaire, um, the kind of tech overlord, <laughs> the slightly complacent, shall we say, um, baby boomer property owners who have become just kind of vastly property rich by just the mere fact of growing older, you know, <laughs> who were able to practice the kind of entrepreneurialism that is kind of unthinkable today. You know, I, I feel such envy when I hear stories about of, of people from my parents' generation talking about their university education or their kind of moving into cheap neighborhoods to kind of hone their poetry or, you know, the, all of these. It, it just sounds so dreamy. It just sounds just right. like they're talking about a another century, not another generation. Well, I mean, they are talking about another century, but another millennium. Well, I mean, I guess they are talking about another millennium too. That was kind of how the Darvishes came to be created. And of course, because Macbeth, the play begins with an elevation and um, that he's promoted from Thane of Glamis to Thane of Cawdor. I thought it would be funny if um, to, to begin the novel with the, this promotion of this local man to a kind of a knight of the, a knight of the realm. <laughs> and then, then everything kind of went from there. The book follows different points of view. So each each section embodies a different character and then hopefully kind of creates the effect of the ground constantly shifting under your feet as you're you're constantly knowing a little bit more than the character whose perspective the uh, as you're in or kind of being a little bit behind the person that comes next. And so when I began the novel, I actually didn't mm -hmm. know that I was going to end up um, entering into Lady Darvish's head. That, that that decision came really late on in the yeah, writing okay. process, but once I was I was um, kind of in her, kind of inhabiting her, she just I was, she was far and away my favorite character to write in this novel. She I, I just really love her in a in a way that's quite different than how I love the other characters. She was so surprising to me. She was so I was I was really just expecting her to be an upper middle class housefrau every single time. 
she came back onto the page. I was like, wait a minute, who are you? This was great. <laughs> One of the reasons I also wanted to get us sort of into the Darvish's world and the Munn's world as well is I kept wondering, and this goes back to your shifting ground thing, because yes, the ground was constantly shifting and I loved puzzling out because you would drop these sort of tiny clues. If you're paying attention, this book, the payoffs are, it's constant. It's absolutely, con there's a conversation um, that clearly happens between Tony and Sir Owen that is just a delight to read. But I kept also thinking to myself as I was reading, who's the biggest liar? Even Lady Darvish, who I quite like, like she tells herself some lies until mm -hmm. she doesn't. And I don't know if I have an answer to who's the biggest liar, but it was fun <laughs> to keep thinking about that as I went because I didn't really trust anyone. You know, I liked the characters and I liked the roles they have. Even the characters I didn't really like, I liked them. It was fun thinking about like, who's the yeah, yeah. problem? It's who's really, I, don't, you know? I don't actually know how I would answer that. Now looking back, because um, I've, I've written three novels now, so I kind of start to see threads. It's quite interesting because, you know, you, you don't often notice um, what, you, what are your kind of lifelong preoccupations until, until you take a, take a beat and kind of look back. And I think that I one thing that does link all of my books that I they're quite different superficially, but they they're all really interested in in fictions that the, the the kind of the fictions that we tell and the mm -hmm, mm -hmm. way that those feed into the roles that we play and the and and you know act of deception yes but also deception by consent you know kind of by, by mutual consent. Yep. <laughs> For example, like when you read a novel, I mean, of course, the, what you what you're reading about is not mm -hmm. real at all, but you're you, the reader, are agreeing to be deceived and and hopefully kind of hoodwinked as well. If it's a if it's a plotted novel, you kind of want to be outfoxed by the book. Yeah, so I'm kind of I'm I'm, I'm very interested in that, and it's true that in Burnham Wood, everybody does kind of practice deception in some way. They use deception in their lives, sometimes in ways that serve serve them, and sometimes in ways that don't. Just I'm just thinking about Shelley actually. That the the first mm -hmm. time we meet her when she decides to betray Mira in this kind of awful way by sleeping with the person that she knows Mira is in love with. She's never funnier or more attractive than, than right after that moment that she decides to betray her friend. There's, there's this, the decision to betray, to deceive kind of unlocks in her this kind of dark capability. She doesn't, she doesn't ever really match <laughs> later. You know, she's, and in and, and that first scene with Tony, she's just a cracker. She's just every everything she says is is on point and super funny. Well, in a kind of yeah, in, in, in a way until the conversation kind of goes in a different direction, but <laughs> that's to give away too much. I'm kind of interested in that. I'm interested in how deceptions can make you feel more of yourself or can 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 unlock something in in you that you didn't know you had working as a screenwriter now I quite often have to pitch for projects so it's kind of you you are in, in front of a panel of people and you're you're trying to advocate for your ideas in as fluent as way as possible I just get dreadfully nervous in front of these meetings uh, uh, before these meetings and so it sounds kind of pathetic but I go into the bathroom and I look in the mirror and I just pretend that I'm somebody else I just tell myself that I'm somebody else I've just picked somebody who I admire and who's got a lot of success as a screenwriter. And I just look in the mirror and I say, you know, you're Aaron Sorkin today, you know, just go and be Aaron Sorkin in this movie or whoever it is. And right, right, right. It's, it's interesting though, how much it works, kind of unlocking some sort of objectivity that you can, you can kind of step out of your subjectivity and almost see yourself from the outside or, or at least forget about seeing yourself from the inside for a moment, you know, and that, that it can, it can lead you to kind of interesting places. But it's dangerous too. <laughs> but one of the things I love too about Burnham Wood is you do use the very classic three act structure. And yes, each each sort of let's call them each party has their sort of moment, right? They we get deeper into their POV in each of these. And I sort of feel like you needed that sort of very classical structure because there's so much happening, because there's so much knitting together and there's pardon the metaphor knitting together and then so much unraveling and all of this constant movement, both in people's brains and their physical space and their interaction with each other. It's wild how much happens in this <laughs> book. So I know, obviously, we've talked a lot about Macbeth and Shakespeare being, you know, and it's not like you haven't written novels before or screenplays or anything else, but 
Can we talk about some literary influences for a second? What else is built into yeah. Burnham Wood? Well, I mean, the, the biggest influence by fire is um, Jane Austen's Emma, okay. um, which I came to as a screenwriter. I adapted it for, uh, for a film a couple of years ago, about three years ago. But of course, in the adaptation process, just had the chance to read it and reread it and reread it. That is a book in three volumes um, and a book that I was astonished coming back to it, ha having learned a little bit about screenwriting structure, mm -hmm. I was astonished by how perfectly it conforms to all of the 20th century and 21st uh -huh. century screenwriting wisdom, which is kind of incredible. I mean, if you think, you think about the fact that, of course, the cinema is still 100 years away when, when Jane Austen is writing, right. uh, writing this book, and really speaks, I think, to the, to the fact that a three-act structure is something that I mean, we, we, we think about it so much in terms of the movies nowadays, but really it's an ancient concept. I mean, it goes right back to Aristotle saying that a story must have a beginning, a middle and an end. You know, that's one, two, three. I think it was it was my screenwriting training, I suppose, or kind of my reading about screenwriting craft that got me really interested in, in drama and in trying to write a book that was dramatically kind of structured for maximum drama in the sense of having not just one turning point, but two, like not just one I irony, but a second point where the irony was ironized again, you know, kind of really trusting in the kind of the triplicate nature of change, you know, that that it's not just enough to reverse something, you have to reverse it again. That's, that's mm -hmm. actually, that second reversal is incredibly important. So Jane Austen, for sure, I mean, she, far and away, she's the, she's the kind of the biggest influence on the book. But in terms of other references, I, I've, I've read a lot of 20th century crime. I mean, James M. Cain is one of my favorite writers, and you probably wouldn't see much of him in in the book. But yeah, I don't I don't know actually how how his influence. He probably hasn't influenced the book except for through my admiration. <laughs> well, but also, I mean, that sort of sense of noir and dread and a little bit of paranoia. I mean, I can it it felt very noiry to me, even though I knew I was reading an oh. eco thriller, political satire. You know. And I really appreciate a sense of dread when I'm reading a book. It's something, oh, cool. yeah, <laughs> it's something I look forward to. Yeah, like um, Patricia Highsmith was another yeah, right? really it, huge influence on me. And that sense of a kind of a of feverish panic that her characters get into when they've just committed murder. <laughs> and it, it, she makes murder seem so um, undesirable in this way that's just so fun to read that, that it's just it, it kind of. This is ruinous quality to the, the 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 crimes in her books that I I just I just can't get enough of. I really I love it. Actually, Meryl Sparks' Memento Mori just popped into my head while you were talking about Highsmith. <laughs> I'm like, it's been a oh, minute cool. since I've read yeah. Muriel Spark, but like again, that sort of like, do I trust you? Where am I standing? What's going on? Who are you? you know, There's a lot of that puzzling yeah. through. It's cool that you mentioned Muriel Spark, actually. I, I haven't read that book, but I there's a book of essays that I have of Muriel Sparks. And one of them is a, a lecture that she once gave to um, uh, some group of literary people. Uh, people, uh -huh. And it's called The Desegregation of Art. And that was, that was it was such an important essay, a piece of writing for me um, when, when writing Burnham Wood. She adv advocates the use of ridicule and, and says that r ridicule is the, is kind of the one form of protest literature that is is in a way capable of the magnitude of tragedy weirdly that 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 a lot of forms of protest literature while their their kind of hearts are in the right place can end up stalling at the at the place of pathos mm -hmm. rather than being able to kind of b fully blossom into tragedy I mean it's a very funny funny as you would expect from Muriel Spark it's very funny and yeah, yeah kind of dry essay but I love that piece of writing so much it, it kind of it was one of those things that you read as kind of early on in a project that really gives you permission to to go with your your hunch which was in my case it was that I wanted to write a satirical novel that would eventually kind of become something else and Muriel Spark really sh kind of made, made me feel that that was possible you know <laughs> And I love the fact that we're talking about, you know, a satirical thriller that the influences include Mary Shelley, Shakespeare, Emma by Jane Austen, <laughs> James M. Kane, Patricia Highsmith, and this Muriel Spark essay, which now I'm desperate to read because I didn't know it. Existed. How did I, I don't know how I missed that. But I, the idea that you can pull all of these disparate pieces of art 
into a story that never stops. I don't, you know, obviously lots of things happen in Highsmith, lots of things happen in Kane. <laughs> I don't always think of lots of things happening with Jane Austen. I think of it more as talking, talking, talking. I know. And this is, I, mean, I would speak to differ. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the thing that I love about Jane Austen more than anything is that mm -hmm. there's almost no point in Jane Austen where the clock stops. There's different huge distinction in, in fiction writing between description and narration being two very, very different mm -hmm. uh, skills. And then dialogue being the kind of the third skill, which I'm taking actually from Stephen King's memoir on writing, but mm -hmm, he, mm -hmm. he really usefully divides fiction, the, the kind of the task or the project of fiction into those three skills. But what, what's so amazing about Jane Austen is that her novels are almost never descriptive in the sense of just merely being descriptive for the for the pleasure of it it's right everything is narration there's there's no almost no metaphors in her books no similes there's there's just kind of no faffing around you know even even when she, <laughs> even when she's inside a character's head everything is advancing time in some way she's the the, the 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 clock is ticking you know i love that about her and i it i i really wanted to emulate that in burnham woods i think that there are a couple of similes in the book but there are similes that that are within a kind of a character's mm -hmm. vocabulary. They're, they're, they aren't similes that I would kind of impose on the book. <laughs> oh, I know what you're referring to, but we're not going to spoil it here. No, I know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about. But I love the idea, too, that you just described a novel by Jane Austen as something where the, t <laughs> the clock is ticking. <laughs> I just, I love that. No, it's absolutely true. I mean, when I, when I talk I about... I've got to get married. <laughs> no, I mean, it's a bad thing. But... I mean, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely, absolutely right that her sense of pacing is extraordinary. And this book, you have multiple storylines happening and people who need to dip in and out. There's some supporting characters that we meet, you know, in a couple of different ways. There's also a giant acid trip, which made me laugh because I was like, really? Acid? Okay. <laughs> But it worked. I mean, it absolutely, it works in the context. Like every, every piece of this book slots in, in a really organic, pleasurable way, even though like, we're really talking about some, I mean, I, I realize we've been laughing a lot in this conversation and people are going to think what is going on perhaps when they pick up Burnham Wood. But the idea that you can enjoy reading about hard things because the art itself is pleasurable. A difficult subject doesn't take away from the art. And in fact, you know, maybe the art elevates it, maybe the subject elevates the art. I don't really know, but I want people to be able to sit with this book and experience it because you do so much. Well, I guess what I'd say um, to the kind of the general point about the kind of the clock ticking and that kind of thing is that I, I think that social media has really changed our relationship with time i hate calling it a platform because i right. think that that's a propaganda term that suggests a kind of a featureless space which only the, you know the only purpose of which is to elevate and kind of amplify and it has no other purpose you know which is just obviously ridiculous but anyway these these social media environments it's called a timeline so they so they're presented as though things have happened in in real time but really there are none of the responsibilities that are on a person who's really truly in a room with somebody having an actual conversation with somebody where the, the clock is ticking and you know time is passing there's none of those responsibilities are brought to bear on what's what's happening on social media so it's it's very disjointed you can reach back into the past if you want and delete something that made made you look stupid I mean you we can't do that in real life if I, I can't do that in this conversation with you. You know, I, I can't reach back. I've already said it. I feel it in my um, self, a kind of a great nostalgia for, or a kind of a great longing for in social interactions that are more human because they're more rooted in time. They, they kind of take place in time. That was very important to me when I was writing Burnham Wood. I wanted it to be a book that kind of relentlessly pulled you forward where you were, mm -hmm. you were wanting to know what, what happened to the characters because you you knew a little bit more than they do right. early on one of the characters manages to compromise another character's phone and so you know that from <laughs> then on that the, every time she uses her phone you right. hopefully in the back of your mind you're thinking oh no somebody else is listening you know somebody else is somebody else can see that 
though of course she can't see that. Um, she, she, she doesn't know that. That's one of the pleasures of the novel, really, because it's a it's a time bound object. It, it 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 plays with time and it is concerned with time in a way that poetry isn't in the same way, and right. that 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 film is, except for it is taking place in a, in a finite amount of the viewer's time, which is quite different than a novel. In a, in a novel, you you control the right. speed of it in in a sense because you can yep. reread and read faster or read slower, which you we, which you can't do with a film. Is this going to be adapted? Are you going to adapt Burnham Wood as you did with the Luminaries? Yeah, I'm. I'm kind of. I'm. I'm open to the idea. It's so nice to have something <laughs> that's just kind of in the form in which it was yeah. intended. And adaptation is 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 endlessly fascinating. But there are so many concessions that you have to make. There are right. so many accommodations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, not to other people necessarily, but just to life. You know, just to right, the right, right. size of the screen and the the length of the hour and <laughs> and all of that kind of thing. Whereas you can be so dictatorial as a as a novelist. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm I'm enjoying that feeling for the moment. Well, and I really enjoyed reading it. I just there are moments in the book that are so obviously cinematic because it fits the story, not because you know there's another endpoint. It's just it's the way the story unfolds. And I'm just sort of curious how that translate when when you have to strip out the interiority of your characters because again, part of the pleasure of this book is digging around in these people's heads and and knowing what they don't know. I mean, it's, it's the worst kind of eavesdropping or the best kind of eavesdropping, <laughs> however you want to phrase it. But the idea that that gets stripped out and you have to represent it with a visual oh. instead of, and that sometimes, I find that tricky as a reader, that there are times where I don't actually want to see someone else's interpretation of a story on the screen that I would just like to sit with what I think these characters look like. And yeah, I, um, I feel like that about some stories too. It's, right? it's, it's funny. It's a very personal thing, but then, and then other things, you know, it's so enriched by being able to see a wonderfully good looking actor and right? <laughs> I, just enjoy, enjoy their company for a while. As much art as we can have, can we just have all of the art? I think that's really what <laughs> I'm arguing for is like, let's have all of the art and all of the forms and maybe not everything has every form. I mean, maybe some things just sit, as they are kind of thing and we'll see what happens do you miss these characters do you miss this world that you created because it's very intense not really no i don't actually but that's just because i i still feel very close to it you okay. know with pu publication um and talking about it a lot at the moment and reading from it from the first time and encountering yeah. people who are, who are reading it for the first time yeah but it's i mean it's a funny thing to write a novel i i wrote um pretty much all of this book during the lockdowns I only really started working on it in earnest um in 2020 I was pregnant at the time and then oh. obviously after that I had a little baby <laughs> and then a toddler running about while I was finishing it this is a book kind of more than any other that feels so much a product of my immediate domestic environment which is very contained and you know kind of we didn't we just didn't see anybody for a couple of years like many 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 people didn't of course but in my case I was living in the United Kingdom with my husband and then my daughter and we didn't have any family nearby and it was just us we were just, we were just this little unit so it kind of feels extra strange for the book to be now out in the world because these it almost feels like these characters were a part of my marriage you know they were kind of a part of my my, my home life for such a yep. long time <laughs> and now they're common property and it's and it's nice but it also feels kind of weirdly disembodied because it, it kind of there's there's something so intimate about about how this book kind of came about. It's so interesting to hear you describe this sort of epic political novel. I'm enjoying listening to all of the influences that made this really sort of riotous story and, you know, people's egos colliding and all of this. And it just, all of these different story elements came together. The first time I read the book, I whizzed through it because I just could not put it down. And the second time, obviously, it's you're reading for plot, you know, you're just reading to prep for an interview. And that's a totally different set of muscles. <laughs> I got to experience two different ways. And uh, it's so satisfying. Oh, I'm so pleased to hear so that. So satisfying, this book. <laughs> the reason that really was my, one of the things that I always say about, that everyone always says about Emma, Jane Austen's Emma, is that it's a book that only gets better with each rereading. You know, it, it has been called the first ever detective novel, where you have to play the role of the detective. And of course, you've totally missed that 
that's your role <laughs> the, the, the first time that you read it. Then the second time you see that she's planted all these clues and she's having mm -hmm. all sorts of fun at your expense, kind of all the way through. And then kind of the third and fourth times, you know, admiration just grows and grows. So that's a yes, huge compliment. <laughs> uh, there's a lot. There is a lot in Burnham Wood. I'm so glad we had a chance to chat. This was so much fun. But I knew this was going to happen too. We've hit time. <laughs> I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> Eleanor Catton, thank you so much for joining us on Port Over. Burnham Wood is out now. If you haven't read The Luminaries, great. It's 853 fabulous pages. Go to Burnham Wood first. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. I've had a lot of fun. <laughs> Hello readers, it's time for another TBR Top Off. We're going to recommend a couple of wonderful books to pick up when you stop in for your copy of Burnham Wood. I'm Mark coming to you from my Barnes & Noble in Cincinnati, and I'm joined by my book buddy, Madison. Hello, Madison. Hello, I'm Madison coming to you from my store in Los Angeles. So we've got a couple of great books to talk about. I'll go ahead and jump right in. I wanted to bring up a book because I was thinking about Burnham Wood and the way that it is a mystery thriller, but has some avenues that make it just an extra ounce of quirky. And it made me think of one of our former monthly picks at Barnes & Noble, and that is The Appeal by Janice Hallett. This book was so much fun to read. It is a puzzle told through various pieces of evidence. So it follows a local theater troupe that gets entangled in this crowdfunding conundrum and somebody ends up dead. Cut to two lawyers who are now sifting through emails, messages, letters that their bosses tasked them to sort through in order to help them solve this murder. Readers, though, are the real sleuths in this book. We get to pour over the correspondence, identify clues and help solve a murder that might be a little bit closer than we realize. There still manages to be a fun twist, and you can be surprised as you're reading. The way that this is put together is just so clever, and I appreciate a mystery book that feels like you get to be a part of the action. Like I said, this was one of our monthly picks from 2022, and with good reason. It's a crafty mystery. It unfolds in a really unique way. And it just feels interactive without losing the narrative, which I think is a tough needle to thread. But Janice Hallett did it wonderfully with The Appeal. So check it out. Madison, what do you have for us? So I was thinking of books to recommend. I also kind of went, it is a sci-fi, YA sci-fi fantasy, but I feel like it does have mystery elements to it because there is a mysterious disease that is causing mutations at an all-girls school. And that is Wilder Girls by Rory Power. It was also a YA book club pick um, when it first came out. So in Wilder Girls, it's kind of like if you took the show Lost and then also took the cast of Lord of the Flies and like put them together, but at an all girls school is how I would describe this book. So what happens is the Rockster School for Girls is put under a quarantine because there's a virus they call Tox that has hit their like portion of where they are on this like island kind of setting. And it at first it attacked all the adults. So that's where like the Lord of the Flies reference comes in. There's no adults, really no teachers. So you just have this all girls school trying to figure out this virus that is attacking them. And they just know they can't go into the woods because there's untold like terrors and all this stuff they've been told to like keep them safe, like just stay in the school. The best bet is to stay in the school until rescue comes, but rescue isn't coming. And then one of the girls goes missing. So our main character takes it upon herself to go in and try to save her. And that's where you kind of learn the mystery aspect comes in and the story kind of unravels. And unfortunately, they learn that help is not coming. So then they have to figure out how to take down this virus, get off their island, and figure out why them specifically, like why they were targeted. So that's why it kind of has everything you kind of want in a YA novel. You have the sci-fi element. You have your female heroine who doesn't need a man, which I always love in a good book. And you have the mystery aspect of why this virus 
and why is no one helping them? Which is why I recommended Wilder Girls by Rory Power. Fantastic. You ha- I mean, you had me at this feels like lost meets Lord of the Flies. So sold. Mm-hmm. But that's all we have for today. Thanks so much for tuning in to Pour It Over. Please give us a rating and make sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can also follow us on our socials at Barnes & Noble. Pretty simple. I'm Mark. You can follow my home store at BN Westchester. And I'm Madison. You can follow my home store at BN Events Grove. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Happy reading. Bye. Happy reading. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. Pour It Over is a Barnes & Noble production. To help other readers find us, please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.